This is Cultural Sunday. Uh, we celebrate all cultures as well as Black History Month, which is very important that we don't overlook or overstep. Come on, clap it up for that. And we want to make sure that everyone knows whether you're black, white, Asian, whatever descent or place you come from, we all have the same needs. We want to find a big God. And so we welcome all of you, rich, poor. It, it really doesn't matter. We want you to be a part of what we believe God is doing here. And I believe that this message this morning is probably one of my most significant in the entire series that we have been doing. And I wanna make sure it's communicated well. And I want us to pray for a moment um, until we feel, or I feel, that I, I am ready to deliver that which I believe God has spoke. Because if this works right, then all things work right. Right, if this works right, this, like, so when you think about a sermon, it's like this. If you say what God says accurately and right, people's lives lead better. If you miss it, people's lives lead worse. And so in this moment, I want to make sure that we are in the right posture with God and saying what God wants us to say. Just want to quickly also remind you, for those that may not be aware, we have a cry room designed for parents with children. If your children happens to pop off in the service like all children do, that's not an indictment, that's what kids do. They can't sit still for too long. We have a cry room, just go in the lobby, you can watch it, feed your child, whatever you need to do. We wanna make sure we have it conducive and comfortable for you as you're worshiping with us. So I want you to take a moment and I want you to pray with me that God would, God's will would be done and that you would hear it in a way that benefits you, not your neighbor, not somebody else who you think needs to hear it, but you, that it'd be a personal time where God is speaking directly to you. So let's take this moment and pray. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, this gift that you've given us to communicate the gospel, you use our tongue as a paintbrush, and I pray that you would allow us to paint the picture that you had designed in eternity. This message, I pray that it would change and transform hearts and minds and souls. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would get the glory from this moment. I pray, God, that, God, you would use this time of ministry in a way that they would never believe. By the end of this message, they would say, God spoke to me. And Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are not limited by location, that just as they're watching online and just as we are in the sanctuary, we can feel the same presence of the Most High. And so we ask you now that you would descend upon us, that you would speak to us, that you would invade our hearts, invade our souls now in the name of Jesus. We ask you for your power. We ask you for your anointing. We ask you for your grace. We ask you for the unction now in the name of Jesus and for that person that is weary, that is heavy, that cannot focus because their mind to focus now in the name of Jesus. We ask those that are outside thinking of different things, God, to center them to hear your word in the name of the Lord. I ask you that ministering angels would descend upon this place, would descend upon this word, and ministering angels would send it throughout the airwaves that hearts and minds will be changed. And Lord, I pray that you would bless us because we heard your word. I pray that you would bless us because we received your word. I pray that you would break scales off of our eyes. You would open up our hearts to receive different things. You would cause conviction to cause us to change and to be better in the name of the Lord. We thank you for the presence being here. We thank you for your grace being here. And we, we, we descend that you may ascend. We decrease that you may increase. We decrease that you may increase, Spirit of the living God. Would you fall fresh upon us now? I pray for marriages. I pray for singleness. I pray for their money. I pray for their joy. I pray for their peace. I pray for their health. That, God, you would begin to turn things in their favor. For those that don't believe that favor is following them, they would begin to see that favor turning in their favor, that things are turning in their favor that things are turning in their favor, that you would bless them a thousand times 
in the name of Jesus we pray. If you receive that, would you open your mouth through your mask and say something to God like you believe that you believe? Come on, if you believe that, would you open up your mouth through your mask and say something like you believe that you believe that you believe? Glory to God. So I want to begin first by welcoming all of our guests. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being with us this evening, this afternoon, this morning as we share God's word. We've been in a series on relationships. It's not just about marriage. It's about dating. It's about friendships. Everything in the world is hinged on relationships. And I think today is going to be a very important installment in that concept. I want to read James chapter number three to you in the Message Bible. James chapter number three. We had an, if you missed it, you need to go back and rewatch it. We had an amazing marriage panel discussion on the TKC website, on the, on the TKC YouTube page and Facebook page. I encourage you to go back and watch it. We had an encouraging and an amazing conversation for singles on that Tuesday. So I encourage you to go back and rewatch it, rewatch it, rewatch it, write notes, share it. It's great information, it's great content. It'll make your life better if you apply what you hear. James chapter number three, I'm reading out the Message Bible. It says this, a bit in the mouth of a horse controls the whole horse. A small rudder on a huge ship in the hands of a skilled captain sets a course in the face of the strongest winds. A word out of your mouth may seem of no account but it can, it can accomplish nearly anything or destroy it. It only takes a spark, remember, to set off a forest fire. A careless or wrongly placed word out of your mouth can do that. By our speech, we can ruin the world, turn harmony to chaos, throw mud on a reputation, send the whole world up in smoke and go up in smoke with it, smoke right from the pit of hell. This is crazy and scary. You can tame a tiger, but you can't tame a tongue. It's never been done. The tongue runs wild, a wanton killer. With our tongues, we bless God our Father. With the same tongues, we curse the very men and women he made in his image. Amen. Curses and blessings out of the same mouth. Today, friends and family, I want to talk from this subject title, A Beautiful Face but an Ugly Tongue. Uh, I just want to talk for just a, a brief moment a beautiful face, um, but an ugly tongue. It, it is quite possible to have a gorgeous frame, beautiful face, beautiful brain, and an ugly tongue. Meaning you look good, but your words are deadly. This sermon's objective is to focus on communication. Communication is the lifeblood of any relationship. Many relationships have been repositioned, ruined, or in the stage of regret because of an ugly tongue. James deals poetically with this concept. He says, a little rudder has the power to turn a ship, and this tongue has the same power to turn a massive ship. This tongue has the power to set a city on fire. This tongue that speaks can be a weapon of mass destruction. James asked about taming the tongue. Interesting, he says, the tongue can, it's been said that you can train and tame lions to a degree, but can't tame the tongue. Communication must be constant and communication is an art that must be perfected. Most relationships don't have a money problem. Most relationships don't have a love problem. 
Most relationships don't have a going out problem, they have a tongue problem. This morning, whether you're watching in the US, whether you're watching in Africa, whether you're watching in Europe, we will learn the power of the tongue and potentially, with the help of God, some practical ways to use our tongue to paint art rather than weaponize it for destruction. Please also remember as we're celebrating Cultural Sunday that your upbringing has a major playing and contributing factor to how you communicate. On a business note, every level has a new language you need to learn. And hopefully you are learning it well. So James begins with this poetic piece about how powerful the tongue is, about how it can cause fires and how it can turn a ship and how a horse is controlled by a brittle, but it's using the metaphor that the tongue can control the direction of a conversation. The tongue can control the direction of a relationship. Um, but then it also, in the Old Testament, we find that when God saw in Genesis 11, they were building this big old tower that was potentially going to go to heaven. God did something to stop it. He changed their language. Yes, he, did. he disorganized their tongue. Their ability now to have conversation was, was scattered and no one could understand each other. And what once was a beautiful effort to build this huge tower in Genesis 11 ends up being decimated because no one could understand each other. Acts chapter number 2 when the church is coming together and they're in the upper room and they're praying, it is amazing that God sends tongues of fire so that they could understand each other. It's symbolically saying in order to have an effective community, we one have to understand what each other is saying. And, and then he even goes on further and says, don't let anybody speak in tongues unless someone can interpret it. Because there can be no benefit if I don't understand what you're saying. And how many times in our relationships are one person saying one thing, but the other person is hearing another thing? And it's not that they don't want unity, it's just that we have a tongue problem. I want to utilize um, this kind of wheel as a building block on which we will continually hold our thoughts on. As Dr. Emmerich writes this unique wheel that says, when a male feels love, he reacts, hold on, let me say it again. When a male is motivated by respect, he in turn gives love. When a male is disrespected, he in turn speak out of love. When a woman does not feel loved, she resolves to disrespect. So let's use this as a premise to where we build our future by saying, if I'm not seeing respect, then maybe it's because I'm not giving it in love. And if I'm not getting it in love, maybe it's because I'm not giving respect. Let me say it one more time. Let me back that thing up in, in the word juvenile's words. So let me say it one more time. It says, if you're not receiving it in love, maybe you're not giving the respect. And if you're not getting the respect, maybe because you're not giving it in love. Now let me balance this equation because we can easily use that point as a weapon of mass destruction to other people. You need to understand that love is taught. Because how you want to be loved is not the same person to person. One person loves flowers, another person hates it. One person loves surprises, another person finds it offensive. 
So we need to learn. There was a great book a while ago called Teach Me How to Love You. So that's a very important formula. I think you should write it down. He reacts without love when she reacts without respect. And she reacts without love when he doesn't give respect. Let me just kind of peruse some things and help you navigate through what James is saying. I like the verse also in math in Corinthians, in, in the book of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 7, there was a, on the marriage panel, one of the um, couples asked the question, well, how, how, how many, in 2 Corinthians 7 is about, um, it's better to marry than to burn, and, and it, it says um, as a verse that, the, it, it, it's an interesting one in the Message Bible, it, it talks about how you're supposed to conduct yourself and it says that the marriage bed is not the place to stand up for your rights when it talks about relations how does that work and someone asked the daring question on the marriage thing well how many times a week is enough and, and the question the question can only be answered from person to person some people need it five times some people need it once. But, but scripture is saying that if you're married, but let, me, let me just pause and say, and on the single part, that, that relations was not supposed to be an audition practice. But let's, 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 let's be honest, if you've experienced that, then, then, then you, you need to figure out ways on how not to put yourself in that position because the greatest deterrent to maturity is memory. Because memory will stop you from growing and memory will always cause you to repeat what you felt. So, so as, as, as mature believers, we, it's easy for people to just throw, well, as singles, you just need to, you don't stop. Well, if I have a memory of how it felt, Ooh, it just got hot in here real quick. So, so if, you, if you have a memory of it, that, then I need to figure out what triggers me towards that and be mature enough to know that memory is oftentimes the greatest detriment to my maturity. But it says that in the marriage bed, that's not a time to stand up for your rights, and so you need to dis discuss what it is. I like the verse that Paul says, that even if you're fasting, he says, go back and get some. <laughs> Lest you be tempted by the devil, which has always been an oxymoron. Well, isn't that when you're the spiritually the most strongest? It's almost as if he's paralleling anointing to sexuality. I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna mess with that. I'm gonna leave it alone. I'm gonna leave it alone. Some would say the anointing is an aphrodisiac. All right, let me keep y'all. Y'all All right. All right, let me keep moving forward. It says this. Here is what Paul says. It's not time to stand up for your rights, and that needs to be communicated what you want, because people cannot read your mind. But it also says, Paul is very clear, that if you play the holdout game, you may be setting up your spouse for a trap. Because in today's world, they're freely giving it away. You don't even have to look good. If you got a rental car, you can get some. I'm trying to... All right, let's keep it moving. Somebody put something in my water this morning. All right. So here's a very important piece of communication that I think is, is so important that we know that you and I cannot make a preference a principle. Just because you prefer it doesn't mean it's a principle. 
prefer to be greeted this way. Well, that's your preference. It's not a principle. We, we got to be careful that we're not imposing our preferences on people as principles. Because it happens in our culture. People want to be served a certain way. And if you go to a restaurant, if they're not doing it the way you like, you, you don't like it because that's not your preference. We have preferences in music. That doesn't mean a music is bad because you don't like it. It just means you don't like it. We have to be careful that we're not letting our preferences become principles. The biggest problem is we do not listen to understand, we listen to reply. We, we do not listen to understand, we, we listen to reply. The tongue is a powerful thing because you could whip somebody with your tongue and they may forgive you, but they may be wounded by you. Here's another piece that I think is very important that needs to be highlighted is that communicators, you cannot convince people who don't want to be convinced. A lot of times we misunderstand individuals in the process of communication and they try to rectify the communication and you don't want to hear the rectification because you're convinced of the feeling you wanted to feel. You understand what I'm saying? I wanted you to upset me and you gave me the ammunition to go off on you because I wanted to feel that way. And even if you try to correct what I heard, I'm going to still feel that way because I'm not going to be convinced because some of us like being angry. And some of us like being angry because it gives us permission to say what we didn't have the goal to say in an actual conversation. You know, sometimes it may be true, sometimes it's not, but you can oftentimes know what people feel about you when they're upset. All right, here, here it is. It's imperative when we disagree to speak in ways that heal and not hurt. It's, it's imperative that we, di we will disagree. That's a part of life. My kids disagree with me. My spouse will disagree with me. That's a part of life. But we must speak when we disagree to heal and not hurt. Communication is not only what you said, but what they heard. Because just because you meant it one way doesn't mean they heard it another way. Have you seen an advertisement that was meant to say something else and all of a sudden you heard it a different way and were offended by it and now they got to change their advertisement not because what they meant was offensive, because what you heard was offensive. And communication is how you're brought up. If you're an only child, you didn't have to communicate with your siblings about what you didn't like. You didn't have to say stop. You didn't have to say go away because you had no one to communicate with. And so now that you're married, your spouse needs to understand that yes, communication is an art that you need to perfect, but not all of us communicate at the level that you want us to communicate because we weren't taught how to communicate. Especially if you're a male, they were taught, stop crying. Everything you heard when you were trying to be expressive was stop. So now you become an adult. And now you're asked to speak and you're a person of few words. If you're a visionary, you're not a great communicator. I'm a visionary. I communicate for a living, but I'm not a great communicator. I don't see details. And I, don't, I can't stand people who don't see what I see. 
I'm being honest. Because I have to learn that I'm a visionary and sometimes what you say sounds like doubt when it's actually just facts. When I go see a broken building, I see beauty in it. I see you change this out and it's done. And when you said, this is ugly, in my head I wanna say, you ugly. Because visionaries see long and far, but they don't see details. We're blinded by details. So you need people who are detailed around you so that you don't get lost in the fact that you don't see details. All of you who are big dreamers probably are not very detailed. And we're going to go take over the world. Okay, how are we going to do that? I don't know. I just see us flying in helicopters, landing on buildings, coming out and doing this. No, 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 no. But you know how much the fuel is? I don't care how much the fuel is. Just get me a helicopter. So we, don't, we need to figure out how are we going to see it. Here it is. This is, this is so important. It worked. I believe this for myself, I believe it for you too. Communication is not only what you said, but it's what they heard. And most times when you have an issue, it's because you forgot something in the detail. I have, I have a friend, we've been friends for years, we fell out of friendship, and then we sat and met, and then we had a mediator meet, and we sitting there talking, we, we realizing at the end of it, we just left out details. It weren't nothing that you did that was bad. It was the details that we both left out that caused us not to see eye eye. And here's the real truth. When you are offended, you don't hear well and you don't see well. So you got to get out of offense so you can hear well. Some people come to church and they're offended. They can't hear nothing you're saying when you're preaching. They think everything's about them. That's because you're offended. When you're offended, every post is about you. That's just how it is. When you're offended, you think they're throwing shade at you and they're not even thinking about you. Because that's what offense does. It makes everything about your self-centeredness. All right, that's, that's an important piece. So here, here's, <laughs> this is important for all of us. It is impossible to love another. This is what scripture in Galatians or Ephesians. It is impossible to love another until you love yourself. And I added this and heal. So it's important to do inventory even when you have relationships on where am I wounded? Because a lot of us bring our wounds into our relationships. It's not that y'all don't love each other. Y'all got a tongue problem. It's not that y'all don't care for each other. It's you got a tongue problem. Relationships that work, work when you heal. You cannot put the responsibility on somebody else to be your healer. Amen. It's the truth. You cannot put the responsibility of someone else to be your healer. And if I know you're broken, it is my job not to break you over again. You, you, you got to know, we all, ex let's just be totally honest. If you live long enough, you're going to experience enough trauma that's going to need you to heal. Yes. Amen. You, you're going to see enough that's going to require you to heal. Whether you're a female, whether you're a male, I know everybody puts on this persona that you got to be winning. because You could be winning and broken. Yes. So it's critical that we learn to heal. You cannot communicate in pride. 
The only reason why some of you cut everybody off is because you're so egotistical you won't pick up the phone and text them. Because you think it shows a sign of weakness when it actually shows a sign of maturity. Don't run from people and then run to God when God wants you to run to people and fix the areas that all you need to do is communicate. There's a great book called Holding Hard Conversations. It's so necessary because you're going to have to hold hard conversations. I met you, you have a baby daddy, you have a baby mama, how's that going to work? I shouldn't stop you from seeing your baby mama because I am jealous. I joined this. But you got to heal first. And that might require therapy, that might require counseling, that might require, the problem is, is we think marriage heals us. Marriage is just a mirror. It exposes your inadequacies. All right, I got 11 minutes. I'm a visual learner. And uh, when I was thinking about communication, I was like, how can I make this make sense because scripture doesn't really spend a lot of time in a marital sense communicating. Because Paul, when he writes, he's not really focused on that. He's, he's trying to hit the hot button issues as quickly as he can. And, and he's, he's like, okay, well, if, if you're single, it's better to marry than to burn. But then the other flip side is it's better to burn than to be married and then burn. So don't rush and get in, in matrimony and then be in misery. Because what looks good online doesn't look good in person. Okay? So let me use, how can I make this make sense? You know, I want to bring something in. Let me use John and Penny to help me with this. Let me see how I can make this make sense about communication. We're going to see how we can... I need, I'm a visual learner, so I need to think of something that would be helpful for us to learn. All right. All right. Um. So here's what, here's what we're going to do. Mano, you're going to stay here because sometimes communication requires a coach. So can you show them how to get on something that they may not be familiar with so that an enjoyable experience doesn't turn deadly? So... So help, help, because you're, you're not less than because you got someone to help you communicate. You're wise because you don't want to have something happen that you can't recover from. So here, here's, a, here's an interesting thing. When a, when, a, when a person gets on the bike, the first thing they're supposed to do is they always start by getting on the bike first to make sure it's stable for the next one coming on. I, I, I just gotta ask you a question. How many of you trying to get on a bike that ain't stable? And then you mad because you fell off. Well, you knew it wasn't stable when you got on in the first place. He had no car, no teeth, no credit, no job, no nothing. You knew she was a problem. You saw all the shoes, you saw all of the high living, and you knew there wasn't a foundation. So before you bring someone on the bike, make sure you stay there. Woo! You need a hashtag. You cute, but are you stable? You fine, but are you stable? Because there ain't no sense of both of us wobbling. Now here it is. Let's not convince stability with the bag. Because some of y'all are looking for, some of you are becoming gold diggers in the spirit. 
Not everybody's going to be perfect, but you should be stable. I had vision, I had student loans, I had dreams, I knew how to pay my bills on time, I had debt, but I was stable. But some of you are passing up stability because they're not completed. You can't just love people on the mountain when they get there and skip the process. Now here it is. I need to make sure the bike is stable to make sure she knows that I'm ready for her to get on. She needs to know, John's like, I used to ride bikes in Haiti, I'm good, I got this. <laughs> she needs to know that, that the bike is ready for her to get on. And, and once she's on, I need to make sure she is comfortable and situated on the bike. Because her position determines her comfort. When we don't know the right positions, something that should be a joy ride turns into a pain ride. So I, I've got to be mature enough to know, okay, here, here's the other thing. Before we start, we must make sure we know where we're going and what signs we need to be alert about because once we get going, sometimes it's hard to hear. So once we start going off into destiny, sometimes it's hard to hear each other because I'm doing this, you're doing that, you're doing that. But we need to both be aware of certain signs. Yes. Maybe your friend ain't text you in a while. Maybe you should reach out and text them. It can't be why everybody not reaching out to me. Maybe they have signs. Maybe that's the month their father died and that's why they disconnect. Maybe that's the month their mother died and that's why they disconnect. I need to know the signs of even friends. I need to know what anniversaries trigger you in a bad way. Because being a good friend is reci reciprocity. Here's another thing. I need to tell her to relax. Don't make any abrupt movements that are unnecessary to overcompensate when I'm leaning into a turn. Act like you're leaning in a turn. Don't fall off the bike. Insurance don't work over here. Lean. Now, now here, here's the thing. Y'all look like models. Let's take pictures. Here, here's the thing. If she don't lean, if they don't lean in together, one of them's gonna fall off the bike. And it's not because the bike ain't good. It's because we don't know how to lean when it gets uncomfortable. We don't know how to band with each other when it's necessary. See, the bike has the power to make you experience something that's wonderful or something that's detrimental. And when you're on a bike, you need to know this because it's very important. You don't just need to watch out for your own safety. You got to watch out for the safety of others. So you got to watch who's coming in and who's going. Don't be so focused on where you're going that you forget there are other people around you that are trying to distract you from where you're going. But here's, here's the other thing. So it says you need to keep both of your movements consistent. Because inconsistency makes communication difficult. Let's be consistent. All right. The thing about riding a motorcycle, apart from riding, it's about sharing the experience. But to ruin the experience is to ride too fast. because some of us are doing too much too soon. Communication is about, is this enjoyable to you? Because it just can't be enjoyable to you and not to me. So this is very important because in a relationship, we must understand that the end goal is to have a good ride. 
But we can't do that if we're not doing the right thing. Here's another thing. When you're riding a bike, it is supposed that you're going, you may fall off. But they tell you wear the proper attire to help you when you fall. Because the objective is, is that even though the bike is enjoyable, many people fall off of it. And in any relationship, it can fall off. You can go through seasons where it's cold, but just don't fall off. You can go through seasons where you're not as communicative, just don't fall off. You can go through droughts where as a friend you feel betrayed and you feel like y'all don't y'all not seeing eye to eye, but don't fall off. And I know we live in a world that it's easy to fall off and not pick up what we fell from, but you miss out on the strength of a relationship if you don't learn how to get back up and get back on. I bet you know this time I'm not gonna do that again. Here's the other thing that's interesting. The most important part of riding with a passenger is trust. I am in complete control of your safety. And you must earn their trust and be careful to keep it. If your passenger doesn't trust you completely, they'll be afraid to tell you things that are on the ride that make them uncomfortable. Now imagine she don't trust him and she's not telling him and she's wiggling and, and he's trying to go somewhere. All of a sudden what's going to happen is they're going to get hurt. Not because the bike ain't good, but because the trust ain't good. Here's the last one. Well, not the last one. This is an important one, even in marriage. It says, you must instruct your passenger, you, Penny, this is the part you probably can do real easy. You must instruct your passenger to hold you tightly. Because if they don't feel you, they may stop thinking you're not behind them. Y'all didn't hear what I just said. It said, hold on to them tightly so that they can feel you. Because if they don't feel you, they may stop abruptly thinking that you got off the bike. And maybe you're not getting love because they can't feel you. Here we go. <laughs> if you're not using helmets to communicate with each other, you need to have a system of communication. If you're not going to use helmets to communicate with each other, you need to figure out a system to communicate. I don't know what system is most effective. Maybe it's, don't talk to me when I first wake up. Or, 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 or if you're in a relationship with happy feet, don't talk to him if he hungry. If I'm hungry, don't you tell me about the bills. Don't you tell. It's a something about when a man is hungry, he don't want to deal with anything or anybody. You got to develop systems of communication. So, hey, every, every Friday we're going to come together and grade our relationship. Every month we're going to come together and grade our friendship. Because you don't take your bike in when it breaks. You take your bike in for maintenance. Amen. We maintenance our cars. We maintenance our watches. We maintenance electronics, update them. It is only relationships that we don't maintenance. We just try to fix it when it goes bad. Why don't you ask your friends, are we really happy being friends? All right. Or what happens is, I feel some type of way about you and I've been feeling this way about you for a long time and when it actually does happen to validate the feeling that I've always had, I blow up at you. All right. 
And here's my prayer for us, and we're done. Thank y'all so much. Let me take a picture of y'all, because y'all look really nice. No, you just got off the bike. Take, let me take a picture of y'all. This is impromptu. Your legs was, it was burning up. It's, 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 I get it. I understand. It's, it's, let's take a picture. Because only at the Kingdom Church can you have a servant with the person on the bike. Right there. But, but here's the thing. Mono, come here. She said her legs were hurting on the bike. Relationships are uncomfortable. I've never been in a relationship where it's comfortable. There will always be areas that ache because we've been together too long. And what happens is you hop off the bike. Go ahead, hop off the bike because your leg hurt. Leg hurt. Now you leave this relationship to get into another one to realize your leg still hurt. What you should have did is say, you know what, no matter where I go, my legs are going to hurt. So I better figure out how to help myself when my legs hurt. So babe, you need to massage this leg. Don't do that in life. You need to massage this leg because that's what we need to have successful relationships. You just can't keep quitting relationships and blaming everybody else. All relationships take work, they take investment, they take withdrawals, but you gotta invest in the communication style. That being said, my prayer for all of us is that we learn how to communicate because communication is an art. Let's pray, Father. Your word is true, and if we apply it, we'll see the fruits of your word. So Holy Spirit, help me, help my brother, help my sister apply your word in a way that's conducive for growth, in a way that's mature. So help us have healthy relationships, not just marriage, friendships. Help us have healthy family relationships by learning how to be better communicators. Lord, help us invest in ourselves to learn how to communicate because communication is not what is said alone, it's what's heard. Help us to hold each other tight that we can feel one another. Help us not to be so impatient to get a ride that we jump on anything that's unstable. Help us to mature even if we have to watch others ride. So Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters that they won't quit on each other. But they will communicate and become better. It's in Jesus' name.